So I want to talk to you today about the gap between what is real and what we think is real. Now, this is a huge academic topic. It can be approached through a myriad of disciplines, but I think a good place to start is two stories from my life. The first story is from two days ago, literally two days ago. I woke up in a truly lousy mood. I was instantly hit with several small problems and with my mood, they felt like small emergencies. And I noticed that in this situation, even positive things felt like negative burdens. For example, I was given an offer to attend a work experience opportunity with a top commercial law firm. This is an objectively good thing for my career. And yet I was flagging up automatically all the things that could go wrong, looking like an idiot, coming across as stupid in networking events. It took me till the afternoon to accept this invitation when my mood improved. And that's my first story. The second story is from a few years ago. It's about my granddad, Ken. Now my granddad, um, I had a great relationship with him because I used to come back to school every single day to his house and we used to talk for hours and hours on end about everything. And we had a great relationship until onto my teenage years. And my granddad, um, my granddad and I, we, we shared so many intimate moments and, and it made it very painful on the day that my granddad forgot who I was. His health deteriorated as he got older and he, he became bed bound in hospital. And when I visited him, he had no idea who I was. He actually mistook me for my dad. He, he kept asking me questions, thinking that I was my dad when my dad was my age. He asked me what was life like on the construction site. And he told me to look after my brother when I had no brothers. Now I tried to steer this conversation back to reality, but I just couldn't. And in the end, I just went with it. Now, I should say that in the last weekend he had with us, my granddad took a turn for the better and we had a great last conversation that ended our relationship the way it should have ended. But this was just pure luck. What unites those two stories? They're completely different. They're completely different in surroundings. They're completely different in significance. They're different in every single way, except one. One person in each story is completely confused. I had forgot the benefits of networking. My granddad had forgot who I was. Now, in each situation, that confusion could have had catastrophic effects and I was lucky to avoid them. This is the suffering caused by the gap between what is real and what we think is real, the gap between reality and belief. We believe something that is incorrect, we act on that basis and then we cause damage to ourselves and other people. Now, when we talk about this problem, which we do, we often focus on my granddad's stories and people like my granddad. People who are so obviously wrong that we know it, everyone can see. But the focus should instead be on the stories like mine. We make thousands of decisions every single day based on intuition, on our mood, and on cognitive biases. And there's an increasing amount of psychological evidence to suggest that is absolutely nothing to do with reality. The signals that we get do not correspond to the reality that we live in. There's a cognitive psychologist, Donald Hoffman at UC Irvine, who has shown quite convincingly that our mind is not even built to interpret reality. We're instead built to receive sensations and neurons that relate to survival and reproduction. Now we can see this play out in the modern world because this is fantastic for evolution but it's really terrible to live in complex societies like ours. Take, for example, the law of behavioral economics, that we overestimate things that we could lose in our lives and the impact that will have on us. And we also overestimate the amount of value that we can get from the things that we chase. Now, in a hunter-gatherer 
environment, that makes complete sense. We want to hold on to the few resources that we have in the wild, and we want to go after the things that might give us advancement in the future. But it also does not map on to the reality of the complex world that we live in. Uh, take, for example, PhD students. PhD students often spend years working towards their, their thesis on the illusion that once it is completed, their lives will be significantly improved permanently after graduation. Now, this great feeling of happiness and achievement does occur for about three days. And after three days, a huge amount of PhD graduates fall into depression because they no longer have the goal and the expectation of attaining their goal was nothing like the reality that they experienced. Now, this is actually a real thing called the expectation gap. It's well known that it's a cause of great suffering in the Western world, especially for mental health. We put something in, we invest our time or our money into something with the expectation of a return and we get even a slightly lower return and it causes anxiety and depression and nihilism. But really, this is just back to our old misunderstanding between reality and belief. Now, what is even more concerning is that the people controlling our money, people making serious decisions, also seem to be held hostage to these cognitive biases. Take, for example, boardrooms. Now, there's this cognitive bias called the um, rhyme as reason effect, which is if something that rhymes, uh, if I say something that rhymes, it, it has more meaning and more truth is accredited to it than something that is not. And there was an experiment where researchers took business leaders and gave two identical presentations about a product. One with the slogan, health means wealth. The other with the slogan, better health leads to stronger financial outcomes. Now, in the first, in the first project, 70% of investors said that they agreed with the proposal and that they would invest. In the second presentation, nobody agreed and nobody wanted to invest. Now, I'm not saying that rhyming slogans will derail our life plans and our life decisions, but it's worth noticing that a very silly cognitive bias in the human mind can actually, it can twist reality for people making some of the most serious decisions that we face in society, investment, financial decisions. And we could probably apply this to our own lives. Now, this is all very concerning. How can we trust ourselves anymore? Well, I, I don't think we need to be too alarmed. First of all, we can forgive ourselves because we know that we're wired in a way that is not even, not even remotely close to interpreting the truth. So we can forgive ourselves for making countless errors as we try to pursue the truth. The second thing is that there's great optimism in knowing that we have a big difference with our reality and our belief. Because if, if our decision rate that comes from our judgments about the world are at 60% good, so in a day, the decisions that we make are 60% accurate, and we make thousands of decisions every single day, then we know that if we just got that figure to 65%, we would be unrecognizable and our businesses would be unrecognizable, and our society would be unrecognizable. Now, there's a huge amount of literature on fighting specific cognitive biases, especially in business. But it's interesting to think of experiments we can do on ourselves on a day-to-day -day basis that we can do straight away that can apply to all misunderstandings, that we can use to try and mitigate all our misunderstandings about the world around us. Now, as I said, this is a usually complicated topic, and unfortunately, I'm an expert in none of the academic disciplines that are relevant. I'm an undergraduate student, I still have spots, but I found some very, very important and quite helpful tools, tricks that we can play on our mind that help us align ourselves much closer to reality. And I want to share with them today. And, and you can try them as much as you like in the laboratory of your own mind. Okay, so the first thing is the starting point. Don't lie. This sounds completely obvious, but it turns out that 30% of conversations between 
undergraduate students like myself, someone lies. Now, I have obviously lied before, but it's taken me a long time to realize that lying is not just an ethical obligation. We, we often say that honesty is important because we want to help or the other people around us, our friends. But the reality is that honesty is about self-interest. If we are honest about what we believe, we get a second opinion. And we can get a valuable second opinion on where we've gone wrong. Now, we can have people around us that stop us from going into a tailspin. And so honesty is the best place to catch all the misunderstandings we have about the world. So that is the best place to start. The second thing is to spectate our thoughts. Now, we know from Hoffman that thoughts arise that are not quite reflective of reality. They're, they're inserted in our brains for other reasons. And we know then that there's a gap between what we want and what our thoughts reflect. And so we need to grip them and try and spectate them. And we can analyze them in a way that actually makes decision making more productive. So we, we can just use verbal skills to actually seize seize this opportunity. We, we can just say, if we're having the thought that we will fail in networking, we can just say, I'm having the thought that I'm going to fail in networking. If, if we, we can even go further and say that I'm noticing I'm having the thought that I'm going to fail in this networking event. Now, this is not a very impressive trick, but it, it does illustrate the gap between you and your thoughts, a great starting point to decide what is useful. And that's the third thing. Name the thoughts and analyze them. Right, you can make this thought a grippable entity. Do not be guided by a cloud of emotion, as we so often are in our everyday lives. Take the thought that is guiding you and analyze it. Is it actually useful? Is it really gripped onto the principles that we know work in the world? If we, if we do this, then we can quite easily get rid of the thoughts that guide our decisions that are completely unhelpful and we can fine-tune our decision-making in the process. Now, these things are small improvements, and they may make incremental differences. But incremental difference in this context could really change our lives. By, by just slightly increasing our decision-making skills, we could be far more successful on a societal level, on a personal level. When my granddad finally came around, that the difference between that my life before that moment and my life after that moment was significant. I thought he was going to die with our last conversation being complete rubbish, being, being nothing close to what reality was. That, that the increasing my well-being by just him aligning for a second back to reality for our last conversation was huge. It's never too late to come back to reality and it's always beneficial. Thank you very much.